Luke 18, 1 says, And Jesus spoke this parable uh, unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. I want to speak to you this morning about seven people who ought to pray. There's seven people here this morning who ought to pray, and somebody, uh, I saw the, I posted that, and they said, I haven't seen the list, but I know I'm one of them. Well, maybe you're one of the seven, too. Uh, the Bible gives us many commands to pray. Uh, Jeremiah 33, 3, Jesus, uh, it says, Call unto me, and I'll answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Matthew 7, 7 and 8, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. There are also many promises given to us in the Scripture about prayer. John 14, 13 and 14, Jesus said, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. John 15, 7, Jesus said, If you abide in me, and, I, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. 1 John three twenty two. Ask, and whatsoever you ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask. We know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. James 5, 16 says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Uh, there is so much in the scriptures about prayer. Our history, can, uh, our history books, at least the ones they used to write, tell us about the effects of prayer upon our, our nation's course and its development through time. Abraham Lincoln said, Many times I've been forced to my knees, realizing that I had no other place to go. George Washington met the crisis of Valley Forge in the Revolutionary War on his knees in the snow in prayer to God. Stonewall Jackson, the Civil War general, said, I have so fixed the habit of prayer in, in my mind that I never raise a glass of water to my lips without lifting my heart to God in thanks for the prayer and thanks in prayer for the water of life. These are, are some of the scriptures that talk to us about the importance of prayer in our daily lives and about how some of the great men of history have depended on talking to God and having God answer their requests to meet great needs in their lives and to meet great needs in the lives of other people. As I mentioned, there are seven people, or actually, as you probably figured out, I'm not going to call names today, but seven categories of people who really ought to pray. Lost people who want to be saved ought to pray. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners, and because we're sinners, we're separated from God. But it tells us that God commended his love to us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that he gave his life to save anybody who'll come to him. In Romans chapter 10, the Bible says, if you'll confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and you'll believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And then Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So a lost sinner who knows that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for our sins and believes that he rose again from the grave. If you'll call out to God in prayer and, and asking for mercy, he'll forgive you and he'll save your soul. The Bible gives us an illustration of that in, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus told us about two men who went up to the temple to pray. One of them was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were very strict and very religious. The other was a public and a tax collector. And the tax collectors were considered very evil sinners. They were way down on the totem pole. Uh, they uh, were traitors to their own people. They uh, were uh, people who would hire out to the Roman government. And as we've explained before, the the reason they were looked down upon so badly is they were charged to collect the taxes that people owed the government, but also they could extort people. And if they and get as much as they could from them, whatever they got above the tax bill, they got to keep for themselves. They were known as ruffians who abused the weak and took advantage of people. Well, these two men, the Pharisee, the religious person, and the tax collector, they went to the temple to pray. 
And Jesus described it that the Pharisee stood and he prayed within himself and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not, I'm not like this tax collector. I'm not like this publican. And the, I says, went on, he said, I, I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes on everything that I, I bring home. But this publican, this tax collector, it said he stood afar off. He was so ashamed he wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but he beat on his chest. And his prayer was, God, be merciful to me because I'm a sinner. In the Bible, Jesus says, guess which one of those men went home justified? It wasn't the, the, the religious Pharisee who boasted and what a wonderful person he was and all the good things that he did. But the one who went home right with God was the, the tax collector who knew and admitted to God he was a sinner and didn't ask for what he thought he deserved, but he asked for mercy. If you're in the place of any one of these men today, if you are a person who feels like you're right with God because you're religious and you go to church and you're better than everybody else, you need to pray and ask God for his salvation. If you're a, a, a sinner and you, and you know you're a sinner and everybody else knows you're a sinner, you need to pray this prayer too because lost people who want to be saved ought to pray. And when they pray, they will get God's answer. He, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord in that way will be saved. The second person who needs to pray is a person who needs wisdom. In James 1.5, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. Can I tell you something you don't already know? Life's hard. You didn't know that, did you? Life is really difficult at times. Uh, we face a lot of decisions in our life that are so critical. If we make the right one, it's going to bring us a lot of happiness and success. If we make the wrong decision, uh, we're, we're setting ourselves up for years and years of problems and heartaches. And sometimes we just don't really know what to do. Well, if you are in a situation where you've got an important decision to make and you don't know what to do, then you're one of these seven people who ought to pray. The Bible tells us about a, a young man named Solomon. His father was David. David was the king of Israel, and David was getting old, and he was about to die. And he uh, bypassed his oldest son, which normally the case was, because God had instructed him that Sol he was to tell the people that Solomon, one of his younger sons, was supposed to rule in his, uh, take over the throne when David died. And Solomon uh, found out about that, and, and, and David died, and he's now the king, and he was just a young man. I tried to find out exactly how old he was when it started to rain. I'm not sure. Some of the uh, commentaries say he was maybe 12. Some may say maybe he was in his late 20s. Uh, I'm really not sure, but still, he, he realized he was a young man and inexperienced. And, he, and as he was pondering this new job that he had and this new responsibility, it says that the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, ask what I shall give to thee. And it's almost like Aladdin's lamp, you know, where he discovers the, the magic lamp, and he rubs it, the genie pops out and says, you can have three wishes, only this is real, this is real life. God spoke to Solomon and said, I'll give, I'll give you what you asked for, what do you want? And Solomon Seems like he didn't even have to think about it very long. And his response was this. He said, and now, O Lord, my God, you have, made me the, uh, you have made me the king instead of David, my father. But I'm just a little child. I'm just young. I'm inexperienced. And I don't know how to go in or come out. I'm not used to making important decisions. And he, he said, if I can have just one thing, here's what I want. Give me understand, an understanding heart to judge my people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge thy, uh, thy, uh, this, such a great people as your people. God said, basically, I'll give you anything you want, anything you ask for. What do you want? He could have asked for wealth. He could have asked for fame. But he could have asked for a giant palace, but he asked for wisdom. And what he asked for pleased God very much. God said to him, because you've not asked, 
Because you've asked for this thing, you've not asked for yourself long life or riches or, or victories over your enemies. You've asked for wisdom, for good judgment. He said, I'm going to answer your prayer. I'm going to give you what you've asked for. But all, I'm going to give you a wise and understanding heart so that you'll be wiser than anybody who's ever been before you. But he said also, I'm going to give you some things you have not asked for. I'm going to give you riches and honor so that there will not be there, uh, you'll be greater than any king who has ever been before you. Here was a man who could have had anything he asked for from God. But he knew the important the thing he needed more than anything else was wisdom. Because he knew being a leader of these people was a bigger task than he was up to. But he also knew God had appointed him to this, and he knew that he knew that God would help him make the right choices and make the right decisions. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. So one of these seven people who needs to pray is somebody who needs wisdom, who has, a decision, has important decisions to make and you don't know what to do. He says, God says, if you'll ask for wisdom, I'll give it to you. The third person who needs to pray today, who ought to pray, is uh, people in tr who are in trouble ought to pray. The Bible speaks a lot about troubled people. You know, and we have different kinds of trouble. Uh, sometimes we get in trouble because we do things we shouldn't do. Sometimes uh, trouble means sickness or it means uh, problems of different sorts. Sometimes it's financial trouble. But we face all kinds of trouble. David was very well acquainted with that. Many of the Psalms talk about uh, trouble and, and how to get help. Psalm 46.1, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Psalm 107 and verse 6, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them all out of all their distresses. Psalm 34, 6 says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. When I thought about people in trouble, I thought about uh, Peter. Peter got himself in trouble a lot, didn't he? <laughs> we ought to be able to relate to him and a lot of the things he did. He Peter was usually, uh, he uh, was pretty quick to speak before he thought things through and to boast about what he could do and what he would do and then find out he didn't have the strength to follow through with it. There was a day when uh, the disciples were out in the, uh, in the sea on a ship and uh, there was a storm came up and that, Jesus wasn't with them. They left him on the seashore and the disciples were in trouble and they were very afraid. And they didn't know what to do. And then they saw, they thought at first was a spirit, a ghost, walking on the water towards them. And then they were really afraid. They're already dealing with a storm, and now here's this spooky-looking creature walking out across to them on the water, and they didn't know if it's a death angel or who it was. And then they heard the, a voice they recognized. It was Jesus spoke to them and said, It's okay, don't worry about it. It's going to be all right. And, uh, and then said Peter, and, and then Peter said, Lord, let me get out of the boat and come walk to you. And Jesus said, come on. I'm paraphrasing the words, but Jesus said, come on. And Peter stepped out of the boat and did what only one man had ever done before, and he'd done it, he was doing it right now, and that was Jesus. And he started to walk on top of the water out toward Jesus. What great faith he had to do that. But then it, it's like in reading the, the passage, it's like he started thinking about where he was and what he was doing. And he thought, I'm out here walking on water. That can't be done. <laughs> I was foolish to try to do that. That's impossible. And he started seeing, he started seeing the wind blow, feeling the wind blow. And he started watching the waves crash around him. And he took his eyes off Jesus and instead he started to sink and he was about to drown. And he cried and said, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. And Jesus came and lifted him up out of the water and took him safely back to the boat. He was in trouble. But he prayed and he cried out to Jesus and Jesus helped him. Do you ever feel like you're out in the midst of the ocean and you're about to drown? 
You're about to sink. You ever feel like the whole world's about to crash in on you and you're surrounded by trouble and, uh, and you don't know how you're going to get out of it? Well, then you're one of those seven people who needs to pray. He said, God is our refuge and our strength. He's a very present help in time of trouble. These disciples thought Jesus had left them because they're out there in the ship without him. But he was on the seashore watching all the time. And when the storm came up, he came right out there to meet them. And when Peter had this great burst of faith and started to walk, what a wonderful thing it was. But he got his eyes off of Jesus, got his eyes on the circumstances, and he began to doubt. And that's when Jesus came and helped him. People are in trouble. Ought to pray. Who's another person who ought to pray? Sick people ought to pray. Sick people ought to pray. James 5, 14. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if they've committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another that you may be healed for the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He said sick people ought to pray. And they ought to get other people to pray for them as well. The Bible tells us about a man named Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the king. And the Bible says that in, in, it's in 2 Kings chapter 20 we read his story. And the Bible says that Hezekiah was sick unto death. He was very sick. And God sent the prophet Isaiah to him. And Isaiah gave him a message that he wasn't real happy to hear about. Isaiah said, God sent me with a message to you, Hezekiah. God says, set your house in order for you're about to die. You're not going to recover from the sickness. And the Bible says that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall because he was crying. And he, and he prayed out, he prayed, he cried out to God. And he said, I beseech you, Lord, I beg you, Lord. Remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done what's good in your sight. And Hezekiah says he wept sore. He poured out his, cried out his eyes to God. And it says that it came to pass before Isaiah had even left the, the uh, palace that the word of the Lord came to Isaiah and said, go back to Hezekiah again and tell him the Lord has heard your prayer. I've seen your tears, therefore I will heal you. Uh, and, and he says that I will add 15 years to your life. Here's a case where, and then, and then he told, then Isaiah told him, the Lord told Isaiah to tell him, you take a lump of figs and put it on your boil and, and you'll be recovered. Here's a case where Isaiah, or rather Hezekiah, got a death notice. It wasn't from the doctor, it was from the prophet. And you know, doctors are sometimes wrong, bless their hearts, but uh, God's never wrong. This wasn't just some doctor's opinion. This is the message that God sent to him, said, Hezekiah, you better get things in order because you're not going to survive. And Hezekiah really wasn't ready to die. He didn't want to die. And he poured his heart out to, heart out to God. And God heard him and God said, okay, you're not going to die. And, and, and in addition to that, I'm going to let you live 15 years more. And God, But he told him, you know, he did tell him, you go ahead and take your medicine. You put a lump of figs on your sore. And that means that when we, you know, we... Let man do his part, but we trust God to do his part too. And God used uh, a, a miracle, but he also used the medicine to bring Hezekiah's healing about. And so here was a sick man who was about to die, and he, he cried out to God, and God healed him. Does that mean that everybody who gets sick and cries out to God gets healed? No, it doesn't. We read about the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he says, he described it this way. He said, lest I, should be, lest I should be exalted above measure. Lest, southern language it means lest I get the big head. Think I'm somebody. He said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. And I, I think it's pretty clear that this was a, some type of physical illness, physical weakness, physical handicap. And it bothered Paul. He thought that it was a hindrance to his ministry. He thought it was slowing him down, holding him back. 
And so there in 2 Corinthians 12, it says, that he, he said, I cried out to the Lord, I prayed three times. And I don't think it just means three times he said, Lord, heal me, like that, one right after the other. But it, it indicates there was three periods of time there, long periods where he spent in prayer and he asked God to take away his physical problem, to heal him, to make him well. Some would say, well, Paul prayed it if he had enough faith that he's going to automatically get healed. Well, I'm not going to be one to doubt Paul's faith at all. I expect he had uh, more faith than, than probably any of us here. He cried out to God and he asked him in faith and God said, no, not exactly. He said to him, uh, the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for thee, for thy, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so what God told him was, I'm not going to, this, this illness that you have, it's for a reason. It's to keep you humble, to make you realize that you need me and you depend on me and that you'll give me credit for everything I do in your life. And Paul said, well, uh, God didn't heal me, but he promised me something else. He promised me that his grace would be sufficient for my need. And Paul said, that's good enough for me. Because he said, even though I'm weak, because I'm trusting Christ, that makes me strong. So if you're sick, you're one of those seven people who needs to pray. And God might respond to your prayer like he did with Hezekiah. He might take your illness away and extend your life. He might respond to your prayer the way he did with Paul. He might not take your sickness away, but he surely will give you grace to bear it. Those of you who attend Wallace Day because this funeral heard me tell the story about, uh, about a week before Wallace died. Uh, my wife Debbie went to see him in the hospital. I'm sorry, in the, uh, was he at the nursing home then? Yeah. And, uh, and he looked very bad. And we'd heard that he probably didn't have very long to live. His cancer uh, was spreading, and he was getting very weak, and he was uh, on oxygen having to breathe. And, uh, and Debbie uh, was talking with him, uh, signing to him, and, uh, and he, asked her, uh, he asked her a question. He said, uh, can God heal me? And she told him, yes, God can. But sometimes God heals people by taking them on to heaven. And, uh, and he uh, kind of bowed his head, and, and Debbie said to him, are you scared? And he said, no, I'm not scared. And then he, he bowed his head, and he signed, Lord Jesus, take me home. And then less than a week later, he was gone home. So he was a sick man who, cried, who prayed to God, and God healed him. He didn't take his cancer away here on earth, but he did take him home to heaven. And the Bible tells us that when we get to heaven, all that cancer is going to be gone and all those other problems that we have. So if, you're a, if you have a sickness, you're one of those seven people who ought to pray. And God is going to hear you. He may, we don't know exactly how he's going to answer. But God will give help and healing to those who pray and pray trusting in him. Who needs to pray? Who ought to pray? People who need cleansing ought to pray. The Bible, uh, I've, I've been studying the Bible for a long time, and I'm convinced of this thing as I am anything in the Scripture. The Bible teaches us that if you're saved by God's grace, you're never going to lose your salvation. I'm also convinced that people are not perfect. I don't have to look beyond my nose to know that. But I, I do know also that Christians cannot sin and get away with it. I know that when we commit sin against God, it affects our life in all kinds of ways. Uh, the, but the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen addresses this. He says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. And when it says C cover your sins, I think it, it pictures somebody trying to hide their sins from the eyes of other people, maybe even trying to hide their sins from God. Every time I think of this, I think of somebody sweeping the floor, and they get this pile of trash up, and they look around. Well, they don't have a dustpan. They don't see the trash can, so they just lift the rug and sweep it under there. Okay, They've not gotten rid of the trash. They think they've hit it, but then the wife comes home, and, 
And he's all proud of himself. I swept the floor and she says, what's that over there? What's that lump under the carpet? He thought he hid it, but he didn't, did he? The Bible says, he that covereth his sins, if you try to hide them, you're not going to prosper. But it says, but whosoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You see, you can hide, we can hide our sins from other people sometimes. Sometimes we can even convince ourselves that we didn't really do anything wrong or there were special circumstances why we did this. and It's not really all that bad. But we can't hide our sins from God. He knows they're there. So if we're somebody who needs cleansing because of our sins, we ought to pray. And I use David for an illustration a lot. A great man of God, and yet he let his guard down terribly bad. Committed adultery. Uh, fathered a child. Uh, out of that, tried to cover up by having the woman's husband killed. Uh, thought he'd hid it from everybody else, but God knew. And David struggled with the guilt of his sin, but finally it, oh, it became too much for him. And finally in Psalm 51, there's a, a lengthy chapter I won't read. I, read, I won't read it, read it today. I read it a little bit last week. But finally he got tired of walking around with a guilty conscience. He got tired of trying to justify himself before God. He got tr tired of wondering, is anybody going to find this out? Who's going to call me on this? And finally he broke down and he prayed to God, Psalm 51, and he confessed that he had sinned against God. He confessed his guilt. He confessed how that guilt ate away at him day and night. and He couldn't find any peace. He said, God, this, uh, this has stopped me from praying. It stopped me from singing. It stopped me from teaching other people. He said, if you'll take all this stuff away, forgive me and cleanse me and make me right with you again, then I'm going to sing your songs again. And then I'm going to talk to you again. And then I'm going to teach other people your way. If you're one of these people who's harboring sin in your life, you're one of these seven people who needs to pray and come clean with God. It's, uh, you shouldn't hesitate to confess it because guess what? He knows about it already anyway. But when we, when we confess our sins, we're agreeing with God that what we did was wrong. We're not pointing our finger at anybody else, but we're pointing right here and say, God, this is my fault. And we're asking God to forgive us. And no matter how ugly and terrible and despiteful our sin is, it says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you're out of fellowship with God, because there's unconfessed sin. You're one of those seven people who ought to pray. Number six, people who need revival ought to pray. We can get stale in our relationship with God. We can fall into the routine, get up, go to church, get up, go to Bible study, get up and read my devotions, even go through a form of saying a prayer, but it's, there's no fire to it. There's no excitement about it. We look around our nation and we see the trouble that we're in. And we're thinking, oh boy, we, uh, things are wrong. Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God help us? Well, Second Chronicles 7.14, God said, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence among my people, then here's, there's the problems. Here's the solution. If my people. Maybe Christians didn't cause the problems in the world, but we can be part of the solution. He said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. We fret uh, about what's happening in our country and the morals that are uh, the, mor the condition of the morals in our country. And yet, when I th think about this, I have to point the finger to myself, grumbling and complaining to everybody about what a bad shape we're in doesn't change anything, does it? We'd be better off instead of grumbling and complaining and pointing fingers about it's this party, it's that party, it's the president, it's the representatives, it's the congressman. We'd do a lot more good if we just cry out to God. If my people 
will do this, he said. But, he says, if my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Maybe this one reason we don't want to do it is because, you know, we point and say all the errors of the country, but what about my ways? What about my wicked ways? If we want revival, if we need, if you need personal revival, if you want revival in our church and in our nation, then you're one of those seven people who ought to pray. The seventh person on the list is people who are concerned about others ought to pray. The Bible says that as, as believers, we are a kingdom of priests. Priests are people who cry out to God in behalf of other people. This is called intercessory prayer, praying for the needs of others. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet, a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Again, verse we read earlier, James five sixteen. confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The Bible tells in Acts 12, how the, uh, the, one of the leaders in the church, Peter, was in prison. It wasn't, he wasn't in prison because he'd done something bad. He was in prison because he'd done something good. He wouldn't quit telling people about Jesus. He told them that Jesus is the Son of God, and he'd been crucified and risen again, and that he was the only way to God. And there were a lot of people who didn't like hearing that. And so they decided, they tried beating him and telling him not to do it anymore, and that didn't work. So they decided they'd lock him up in prison, at least keep him away from the citizenry so he couldn't, be to, uh, he couldn't be causing trouble by preaching the gospel. Well, his church was concerned about him. And so they called a prayer meeting and got in a room and started to pray. And they started praying for Peter. He was in prison. And they were praying for his comfort. They were praying for his release. And while they're in the midst of prayer, there's a knock on the door and the lady goes to answer it and it goes like something like this. Who's there? It's Peter. Peter, Peter, it can't be you. You're in jail. We're praying for you. You know, go away. And so she goes and tells, she kind of interrupts the prayer meeting and says, hey, there's a guy at the door. He says, it's Peter. And their response pretty much the same. Well, just ignore him. We got to pray for Peter. He's in jail. Here's a case. They didn't even realize the power of the prayer that they were praying. They, they didn't realize how eager that God was to hear and answer their prayer. And they just barely got started praying for Peter to get out of jail. And he, there he is knocking at their door. Folks, uh, we have a great privilege and a great responsibility to pray for others who are in need. We need to pray for ourselves. But we also need to pray for others. And I really, you know, I'm, I'm mathematical and scientific somewhat. And, and things need to work in a logical pattern for me. I don't understand how this works exactly. I don't understand how me praying for you can help you. But it does. Because God said it does. And it also helps me. Because when I pray for you, you need the prayers and I need the practice. It helps both of us. Do you have friends, family members who are lost? You need to pray for them. Do you have loved ones that are backslidden away from God? Turn their backs on Him. They won't listen to you. God will listen to you. You need to pray for them. Do you have loved ones who are facing difficulty? And you don't have the money or the ability or the resources to help them? You can do something to help them. You can pray for them. Prayer is a Christian's greatest privilege. It's our greatest tool. It's our greatest weapon. It's our greatest opportunity. We are commanded to pray for others. We have the responsibility to pray for others. We have the privilege to pray for others. So the scripture I read to you this morning says, we, Jesus said we ought always to pray and not to faint. There are seven people here who ought to pray. Who need to pray? Failing to pray is foolish. 
In James 4, 2, the Bible says, you have not because you ask not. There's a lot of things God wants to do for us and give to us, but he says you don't have them because you don't ask. Failing to pray is foolish. Failing to pray is sinful. Second Samuel 12, 1 Samuel 12, 23, God forbid that I should sin against you by ceasing to pray for you. Are you one of these seven people who ought to pray? I'm going to ask you as our musicians get ready to sing. Uh, we ask you to come to the altar often. Uh, every Sunday we give you opportunity. All, uh, some people do that, some don't. I want to ask you today, if you're one of these seven people who ought to pray, who needs to pray, just get up from your seat. Everybody stand with me. And if you want to come to the altar and pray this morning, when, uh, if you want to come and pray during the invitation, you do that and we get finished. I want to pray for, her, uh, for everybody who's in the altar today. If, you need, if you're one of these seven people who needs to pray for yourself, then you come and cry out to God. If, you need, if you're this person who needs to pray for somebody else, here's an opportunity to come and pray for others. So we begin to sing. You come to altar and pray if you want to do that.